Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Elena Trucker. I am the manager and buyer of Napa Bookmine with three stores in Napa County. I am also the chair of the education committee for the California Independent Booksellers Alliance. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I want to thank Penguin Random House for sponsoring our education series. We are much appreciative of their continued support. I am so happy today to I find it, there we go. Uh, to introduce to you Sarah Stein Greenberg, the executive director of the Stanford D School. She leads a community of designers, faculty, and other innovative thinkers who help people unlock their creative abilities and apply them to the world. Sarah speaks regularly at universities and global conferences on design, business, and education. She holds an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a BA in history from Oberlin College. Sarah also serves as a trustee for RARE, a global conservation organization. Among other creative pursuits, she spends her free time as an underwater and wildlife photographer, and she lives in San Francisco. She has a new book out. She's gonna teach us a little bit about that and walk us through its concepts. Thanks so much, Sarah. Awesome. Uh, Elena, thanks so much for that introduction. And um, thank you all for being here today. Um, it's great to be amongst fellow book people. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen um, so we can get going. All right. So um, I want to start today um, by moving that obstructing window. There we go. Um, I want to start today by just acknowledging that we have all been um, in the midst of some very uncertain times. And in fact, we're in a moment where uh, thinking and creating and even like daily decision making looks really different than it ever has before. And in this moment, um, we're all finding ourselves challenged to think in new ways, to act in new ways, to lead in new ways, uh, to conduct our business in new ways. Um, and the, that requires us to be willing to challenge ourselves to adapt to these new norms and norms that are actually like continuing to evolve and shift on a daily basis. And one of the um, pieces of data that I was really interested in um, that came out about um, three or four months into the pandemic last year um, was a study that McKinsey conducted looking at what were kind of the new leadership skills that organizations were valuing most um, in, this, uh, in this pandemic world. So on the right-hand side of this slide, what you see are a series of skills and attributes that um, were really being uh, valued much more highly after the pandemic began. You see you know, a significant increase in the value being placed on being creative and entrepreneurial, and almost as high an increase on rapid decision-making. Um, one that's really important to me uh, from a design perspective is being comfortable with ambiguity. And um, even at the top of that list there, you see things like being supportive and caring, being employee focused. Um, I think, you know, any, any of us who exist as a part of organizations know how incredibly important that was, um, especially in the early stages uh, of the pandemic. And one of the things that I found really interesting about this data is that those aren't often the leadership values that we talk the most about um, in, in uh, sort of our, you know, whether it's in business programs or in, in companies today. And um, I think these also resonated with me because um, at the D School within the Stanford campus, we are constantly extolling exactly these kinds of values um, in our leadership training programs in the classes that we teach for Stanford students. So for me, when I, when I see this list, um, what I actually think about is a picture like this. So if that chart were a photo, the people in this photo are the kinds of folks who I immediately think of as really embodying those leadership qualities. In this photo, you can, you can certainly tell this is a pre-pandemic um, photo. Um, was taken at the end of a really long and intense week of learning and design. Um, this is a group of folks who are the heads of um, nonprofits and government agencies, all kinds of leaders in the social sector coming from around the world. And they were coming together to take a course um, that we teach called Designing Social Systems. 
And you can, I mean, you just intuit from, from the kinds of um, the body language and the, and the smiles in this photo, like this is a group of leaders who have a lot of those attributes and values, caring, that kind of spirit of fun and optimism, um, you know, being closely connected to, to other humans as, as a part of their work. So when I think about that list of, of skills that are rising in importance, one of the ones that really always leaps out at me, as I said, is this idea of being comfortable with ambiguity. And I think one of the reasons that that is really challenging is that you know, none of us took a class to train us to become good at navigating ambiguity, right? That's not actually a skill. And actually, if anybody has, I would love to hear about it. Um, but that's not a skill that we uh, have really foregrounded in our educational systems. And I think it is one of the most important things that we need to be equipped with in the current moment that we're, that we're living through. So I wanna share um, kind of like what this means to somebody who um, is a leader, who has been through some of our um, trainings and our programs at the, at the D School at Stanford, just to give you a sense of how he thinks about the role that design plays in his ability to tackle the kind of work um, with a very creative um, and entrepreneurial approach that, that he's engaged with. So, um, this is uh, a guy, an incredible leader named Lejean Lincoln, and Lejean is the head of young people and community services at an organization called the Peabody Housing Association. Um, and Peabody is one of the oldest and largest affordable housing developers in the UK. Um, and they tackle all kinds of really challenging issues. They tackle underemployment and unemployment and substance addiction and um, educational needs and lots and lots of health issues um, that have been exacerbated during COVID, for example, in the UK. Um, so he is constantly working on challenges that don't have easy or obvious answers. Um, and we asked him to just talk a little bit about his own view towards ambiguity and how he experiences working with design as a, as a part of navigating that. If anyone knew what was going on or how to solve things, we would have cracked it and they would, therefore we wouldn't have all these social problems right so it kind of sounds reason that whatever's happened before hasn't really worked or not or not or not in a way to really resolve and stop certain things so at least thinking about design using design applying design at the very least it gives you hope but at the same time it gives you a really structured and creative way to continue that journey and knowing that there might not be an endpoint you might not reach a point where you've cracked it but you've got a really structured way to continue to know that well, i'm keeping going like i've gone ahead i've achieved this but i'm not stopping there i've achieved an iteration or a piece of work and i'm going to learn from that and then go into the next step and then go into the next step you know so that's why why design it's not about having the answer or sort of coming to an end point it's about i don't know the answer but i'm going to keep going and keep going i've got that hope and excitement and it will always improve So let me just uh, re-emphasize one of those points that Lejean made. So he talks about how it's not about having the answer or coming to the end point. He I don't know the answer, but I've got that hope and excitement and can always improve. And this is the kind of um, learning journey that we want all of our students to go on. Um, it's really that, that sort of underlying superpower that you gain when you start to become comfortable tackling problems that don't have an obvious answer that have been um, you know, tried or have, haven't been resolved over many years. Um, and knowing that you have a set of skills that you can routinely bring to the table to show up when you're trying to solve a new kind of problem. And that, that really is true whether you are working on you know, redesigning a part of your business or redesigning something in your community or something even closer to home. So I want to share um, a little bit more about how we think and talk about design at the D School, because I recognize that this is not how everyone thinks about the role that design can play. But what we what we do at the D School is we really help students think about design as a relationship between problem solving and problem finding. And problem solving is something that actually you know, many people, no matter what your, your background is, you have ways of solving problems. 
but actually problem finding is not something that we're all exposed to. And what's important about problem finding is that in our, in our classes, we really give students the mandate to investigate some of the root causes of the situation and to redefine and reframe the challenge, the problem or the opportunity or the needs that they're finding um, with, with a fresh perspective and a fresh take. So in that, in that work, what you see are when you're problem finding, you're really interviewing other people, you're, you're walking in their shoes, you're observing behavior, you're doing a lot of research, then you're synthesizing that data and you're really critically interrogating, you know, is the way that the problem has been framed really the problem that matters to the people who are um, in this ecosystem, who are the stakeholders here? Um, and then you come up with your kind of the, the definition of the problem that you're going to work on. And when you're working in the problem solving mode, you are rapidly experimenting. You are coming up with and building models and what we call low resolution prototypes to try to um, externalize your ideas early and test them and get feedback. And then you're engaging with a set of skills that's about deliberate communication. You are trying to um, bring your vision of what the future could look like with your incredible solution or your new offering uh, to life in, in that future and to help convince other people to support you and to, to get behind you. So underlying all of this is this kind of superpower around navigating ambiguity. A lot of our students, when they first encounter our, our classes, they're not used to ha being having the responsibility to actually come up with the problem framing, right? But as you know, the faculty in the room, we just don't assume that we really know what the right framing is, and we certainly don't know what the right solutions are. And as a result, our students are given an opportunity to practice those skills around navigating an ambiguous problem situation. And as you start to get good at that, you a little bit start to fall in love with ambiguity. And that's kind of our underlying goal, right? A lot of us have um, kind of a complicated relationship with ambiguity. It can be very disorienting and destabilizing. But what we hope for our students and for anybody who uses our methods is that um, just like Lejean, um, who really knows that he's tackling these social issues that don't have obvious answers. Um, if, in fact, if there is no ambiguity in the situation, there's not really a good opportunity to come up with something that's new and innovative. And, and that's what I mean by like, we hope that people start to fall in love with ambiguity just a little bit and invite it into their work to be able to solve and tackle um, the, the most challenging uh, issues that we face today. So I'm going to give you another example of what this looks like in practice. And this is a story that I wrote about in greater detail in the book. Um, this is a story of four of our design students um, who, were, who were placed together on a team. Um, two of them had a medical background, one had a policy background, one was a civil engineer. Um, so we had this very interesting, diverse, interdisciplinary team working together. And they were partnered with a hospital in Southern India that was working to really advance its mission of delivering extremely high quality, but very low cost healthcare at a large scale. And going into the project, the students thought, you know, they were gonna, they were gonna do anything that they needed to to help advance this mission. And probably what that looked like was um, helping make some of the processes more efficient or reducing cost in some of the systems or, or processes and really working with the clinicians or maybe the administrators in this hospital to, to, design, to design some kinds of solutions that would meet those needs. Now, what they found when they um, went and started engaging with the folks who are deeply engaged in the system was, was something else, actually. They really noticed something that was outside of the original scope of the, of the problem, at least as, they had, as it had been framed. And what they noticed is that in many parts of the hospital, there were actually a significant number of people waiting. And that for many of those people, they um, were actually quite anxious. There was like a palpable um, level of emotion in the air. And as the students started interacting and interviewing, they realized, oh, this is, this is quite you know, normal in this context. There are lots of patients' family members who have accompanied them to the hospital and they are waiting. And unfortunately, while they're waiting, they don't have a lot of information about what's going on with their family member and they are really anxious and they are really scared about what's gonna happen to their family member and what's gonna happen when they bring them home. And part of this is because in lots of these hospitals, 
there's, you just get very, very little time with the actual clinician and you don't get all your questions answered. So the students started to dig in and really try to learn directly from the patients and their families to gain more empathy and gain more insight um, into, this, into this challenge. And as they returned to campus from their, from their research trip, they started trying to put these pieces together and they, they just couldn't let go of the sense that they had really uncovered this really important and meaningful set of human needs that weren't being met. And they decided that whatever they designed, it was going to be oriented towards alleviating some of the suffering and serving that need that these family members were having to be engaged in a different way while they were, while they were waiting um, for news about their, the health of their, their beloved you know, family member. So they started using that process as I was describing a rapid experimentation. And this is an example of one of the students, Jesse, who um, was uh, testing an early concept that they had around how could we train people with just some basic skills around taking a pulse or taking blood pressure? Um, how could we maybe equip people to be part of the care team for their, uh, for their loved one? And more importantly, how could we do that when we're not exactly sure that everybody's going to be speaking the same language or we might be dealing with literacy issues. So they designed this set of, of prototypes to try to test out some of their ideas about how they might deliver that kind of that kind of education. The following summer, they returned to India and they kept testing these ideas. Um, so this is a photo from one of the early pilots that they ran. Um, you see on the left-hand side, there's one of their local partners, um, a nurse who is training a group of family members on how to take a pulse. And one of the students on the team told me later that when they came back for the second day of this pilot, they found that there was a line of people waiting around the corner. And she said to me, you know, that was the moment that we realized this is not a class project anymore. We have really uncovered something important and we are kind of moving directionally in the right, in the right way to figure out exactly what the solution is gonna look like. And indeed, um, this team went on to found an organization called NURA Health. Um, and NURA trains family members all over the region in partnership with, with hospitals to be equipped to be a, a part of the care team um, with, the, with, with people who have been through cardiac surgery, who have had difficult births, who have experienced some kind of accident and, and had some kind of significant trauma. Um, and one of the really inspiring things is that this, this very low cost intervention actually reduces the rate of hospital readmissions by something like 70%. It dramatically reduces post-surgical complications and it really reduces the level of anxiety that these family members experience because they are getting a little bit of um, equipping to be able to be part of the solution and part of the, the care team going forward. So this is a really extraordinary story um, of impact through design. And um, I wrote this book that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you today, in part because I really want more people to have access to these same kinds of methods and approaches that we teach our students um, at the D School. And as I said, this resource is for anyone who is just who is seeking to develop their creative skills, whether they're a leader, whether they're a business owner, whether they're a member of a community. Um, so I have actually um, a very early advanced copy um, uh, to share just to, that I can hold up. Um, this has just recently arrived um, in the mail. And you can see there are um, a whole range of different um, activities and assignments inside. And then there are also a series of essays um, that I wrote to give people kind of a deeper look into our um, our pedagogy and our, our philosophies around, hey, how do you learn these kinds of important creative skills um, in, today's, in today's world? So the book has um, uh, 80 different assignments in it. And you know, some you can do on your own, some you might do with a team, um, some will take as little as 20 minutes and others could take you weeks if you chose to spend that much time on it. Um, but these are all drawn from the, the methods and the, the ways that we teach uh, at the D School. So I wanna just highlight a few for you today. 
Um, two that I pulled out um, thinking about some of the challenges that might be um, most relevant to folks who are um, in the book trade, who, who um, uh, run bookstores um, are these two. So the first one is called experts assumptions. And um, one of the really uh, interesting things about trying to create change or come up with new ideas is that we all have in our heads a certain level of expertise ourselves. And we often draw on the expertise of others in our community or, or in our networks. And drawing on expert opinions can be incredibly important and valuable in getting up to speed in a particular um, area, but it also has a drawback. And that drawback is that experts often are, are a little bit constrained by that sort of feeling of like, I've seen all the different variations or I we've tried that before and uh, it will never work here um, or it didn't work last time. And part of responding to new challenges is that license, that freedom to say like, okay, I'm gonna suspend some disbelief right now about what, what has or hasn't worked in the past. And I'm gonna think about this in a fresh way. So experts assumptions is a structured way to think about what are all of the assumptions that are kind of embedded in the expert perspectives in this field and really think about how you might flip some of those on their head and challenge them in order to come up with completely different ideas. Then on the right hand side, you see one of my personal favorites. Um, this is one that I teach annually uh, in one of our classes called distribution prototyping. And this is a, a really um, fun physical activity in which we have students who have designed some kind of product or service create a physical model of their distribution channel. Like a distribution channel is not something that we often think about as an opportunity, a space for creativity and design, but just like anything else, it is a place where you can apply those exact same skills. So in this case, it, it sounds, you know, it's really unconventional. We don't use spreadsheets, but instead we have people stretch a string across the entire length of a room and clip a bunch of different cards that represent all of the different places in a channel where goods might change hands or finances might happen or storage needs to take place or transportation needs to take place. And in doing so, the students have this amazing array of insights about all the things that they hadn't thought might happen, about ways to take some of the cost out of that. They get to think laterally, they get to think with their whole bodies, and it just unlocks a really different way of thinking about what those opportunities might be for design work in something as conventional and sort of ordinary in the business world as distribution um, or sales or marketing or, or any of those functions. So, um, there is this wide array um, of, of options within the book. What I hope is that nobody reads it just back to front and, and does every single one, that every single person has their own kind of agenda that they might bring to engaging with this material. Um, and actually I gave a few of the folks who are here today um, the opportunity to just try out uh, a couple of these assignments ahead of time to see, to see how it went. Um, and very uh, appreciative of um, Emma and Elena for doing so. So let me, let me share these, these final two and then we'll um, turn to uh, some discussion and Q and A. So one of the assignments um, that, uh, was uh, offered is called the derive. And the derive is actually modeled off of a practice that comes from um, a kind of an art movement, art and political movement um, in France in the 60s. And um, it's the idea of giving yourself a structured way to drift around a certain part of a city or a certain part of the, of the world. And it's really based on this idea, the skill that designers have um, of noticing and, and seeing things in the world in really different and unusual ways. And this uh, experience really helps you train your ability to pay attention and to see things with like, as if it's a completely different set of eyes. And this is one of those skills that I just think is so incredibly important right in this very moment where things maybe even feel like they might be returning on a surface level in some cases to some semblance of normalcy, but actually that's that's not really what's happening. Things have changed in fundamental ways that that and, and are, are continuing to change. So um, for this assignment, um, Emma uh, tried it out 
And um, she was kind enough to share some of her experience. So she said, I chose to do the derive because long walks are a part of my daily routine, but I never deviate from my planned or familiar routes. The most challenging aspect of this assignment was staying focused on the element I had chosen and letting go of all the items and to-do lists in my mind in order to just float. Once I was able to enter that floating stage, I was more aware of my surroundings and more receptive to impressions from the environment. The element I chose to follow was lines. This felt very broad and overwhelming at first, but I stuck with it anyway, and it led to me being able to view the landscape and the world as an almost 2D surface with drawn lines all over it, like an empty coloring book. Then I was able to imagine the scene without lines and drew my own in my head to project upon the picture. This was intriguing and felt freeing to rearrange my perception of the right lines. So Emma is describing how she picked lines as the element that she was going to follow. And then she, she started following one line and that led her to another line and then to another line. And that's how she navigated this derive. She said, reflecting on the assignment afterwards, I noticed that the fact I had chosen lines to follow in the first place signaled I was going to have a hard time not just following the obvious path or street line. In order to fully wander, I had to really go outside the lines and off the beaten path and even make my own lines to fully recognize how influential simple lines are in shaping our lives and worlds, both physically and metaphorically. I'd like to carry forward the insight to have the insight and courage to create my own lines in the right space and time. And I just, I was blown away by the poetry and the depth of this um, experience. Uh, so Emma, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, everybody has a completely different experience with the derive. This is a quite an amazing one. Um, the second uh, one that I offered uh, for is some experimentation is called the wordless conversation. And this assignment is um, designed um, based on some emerging research that having relationships with people who are from different cultural backgrounds from your own can actually spark your creativity and reinforce your ability to be innovative. And there's a catch, which is that these kinds of relationships have to be more than superficial. So that was kind of the original inspiration. And you can do this assignment with somebody who's from a different cultural background, with someone who you work with, but you've never met in person, with someone who you've known for years and want to get to know in a, in a deeper way. Um, and the way that this assignment works is that you take pictures or short videos just throughout your day. You don't try to be clever. You're just trying to kind of document your, your life and, and what's happening. And then you set aside a particular time where you're going to have this conversation only through sending back photos back and forth. And the idea here is not to have just like send random photos back and forth, but actually to engage in, in a process of listening and relating your picture to the picture that you've just been sent and vice versa. So somebody may send you, you know, a picture of their breakfast, which was noodles, and you may send a picture back, which is your breakfast of eggs, and you might keep going that way. Then there's somebody sends like the exercise they did, and you send a picture of being trapped inside on in a rainy day. And through this kind of dialogue, you start to develop this new way of having a conversation that doesn't rely on having a shared language that just lives in the, this visual medium, which is a different way to think about storytelling and it's just a different way to exercise um, your, your creative abilities. So um, let me share what happened um, when Elena tried this out. So she said, I had to really pay attention to everything that was in the photo or video in order to find something to play off of. I didn't want it not to flow and that there were some really funny moments, but it all worked. And then I just love this insight that she came to at the end, which is, you know, there is value in everything, but sometimes it's just hard to see it. So once again, let me thank both Elena and Emma for um, uh, trying these assignments out and sharing. Um, I'll say one more thing before I close, which is that this book, um, Creative Acts for Curious People, is actually the first of a series that the D-School is launching. So we have been spending the last few years really um, working with uh, teaching our, our, our broad teaching community to surface um, some of the most exciting areas of content um, and, and bring them out in book form. And so there's going to be um, another round of titles that will launch in the spring. Um, this one launches in September. 
So in closing, I will just say um, that, again, I think this is the time to be thinking about developing new skills, to be thinking about how we bolster our own abilities to navigate ambiguity, to explore our own creative abilities, um, because we live in a time where there aren't clear roadmaps for how to do many things um, that used to be uh, clearer. And I'll also say that, you know, I wrote this book for the most part during a very sad and very sobering year. And I found an incredible amount of joy and insight working with these ideas. And my hope is that people um, will find as much meaning and utility in trying out these ideas and these exercises that are in the book um, as I did in writing about them. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to um, Valentina or Elena um, and let's talk if there's any questions. Yes, I've received a couple. So uh, one of them was, I think this has to do with the example with the, the team that was helping with the uh, medical application in India. Uh, they're asking, how do you coach a team on rapid experimentation and ambiguity? So maybe if we're talking about managers at a bookstore, but how do you teach that kind of creativity, I guess? Yeah, what a great question. So um, one of the things that we do is we're very aware that not everybody comes to the table having a ton of experience building things, modeling things, and making things. And often, especially when we work with adults, you kind of have to break down your fear of like, oh, I don't know how to build complicated models or, you know, how do I actually express my ideas in a physical um, or, or tangible form? So there are um, a couple of assignments um, that I think are super useful for that. So one is a really, really fun assignment um, called first date, worst date, which is a, it's actually involves Legos, which is everybody's absolute favorite material for getting going with building. Um, and you simply ask everybody involved to create a, a model of their uh, worst first date experience. And then you use that as a way to tell stories. And the advantage of using something like Legos is you're not, at, you're not, you're really just building with existing materials. And it is a really fun way to start to break down any inhibitions in the group with actually building in a physical form. And frankly, if you're talking about low res prototyping, you could just stick with Legos. You don't actually have to graduate into anything more complicated. Um, and then there's another assignment that I would point to, which is really about um, getting people started thinking about how do you bring to life your ideas in a way that you can then test with others. So often you want to actually create a kind of um, semi-realistic environment in which somebody might test out your idea. So for example, I had one group of students who were, who were um, coming up with a concept for people who were um, in hospitals for a long period of time. They had a chronic illness or they were going to be um, recovering over a long period of time. This was like 10 or 15 years ago. So it was kind of, pre, it was pre the Zoom Skype era. And they had this idea for like a wall to wall, floor to ceiling video screen that you could use to be connected with your family at home. And to prototype that and to test that, they had people come into this little booth that they had kind of set up as a hospital room. And they actually had pe people lie on a table. And then they had a group of act like their classmates who were pretending to be medical professionals have like a conversation right near them, but not with them. And what they were trying to do is evoke some of the feelings that you have of, of some degree of powerlessness when you are a patient in this situation. And then they tested their prototype. And so there's a way in which you can stage the environment that actually gives you better data about how people are reacting to your, your idea um, and, and how they might more realistically react if you, if you created that product or service. That's awesome. I love the Legos idea too. It's definitely, it's not just, it's for everybody. It's, it's, that's right, Legos are for everybody. We should yeah. just all <laughs> embrace that that's the case. <laughs> I also had a question that came in. Um, I don't think you. I don't think you addressed um, your interest in design. Like, where did that come from, and its greater implications? For pretty much yeah. the book. Yeah. So I was very, very fortunate. I don't have any kind of formal design training prior to the D school, um, but I had always, you know, sort of thought of myself as someone who like 
you know, was kind of an open-minded thinker and kind of like to look at things in, in sort of a, to kind of find the sort of like, what's the not obvious part of this? So when I got to Stanford as a graduate student, it was around the time that the D school was just getting started. And I kind of wandered into my first class at the D school and realized like, oh, I have found my people. Right. This is a this is a community where people are really interested and committed to engaging with the people that they're designing for before you kind of fully bake what you think the problem is. And for me, a lot of the the ideas and vocabulary and rigor around things like prototyping was really new. And it kind of took my own sort of like burgeoning creative abilities to the to the next level to have some of this training and practice. Um, and then I just, I really find that for me, knowing that there, there is a discipline and a rigor around how you might pursue innovative ideas, that it's not just like, oh, some people are just kind of genius creators and everybody else is not. I just don't think that that's true, but I do think it's really helpful to have the kind of support and the training and the vocabulary. And the, the last thing I'll say about this is that now having taught for so long and been around so many teams that have different kinds of disciplinary perspectives and backgrounds and different ways of viewing the world, we see design become like the common language that they use to tackle a project together. And that also unlocks this like just amazing array of new ways of thinking about um, a problem or a project. So like one of my favorite things to do is like invite in somebody who's not an obvious expert in your field, but might have expertise in healthcare or in policy or in education and, and, and just ask like, how would you approach this problem? And that way of, of seeing opportunity in everybody's different expertise, I think is just, it unlocks a ton of creativity and innovation. I love that. Actually, I have another question that I think ties into that and was a response to the ambiguity question was, um, have you found that the skills people develop through this method, I think that's the Legos, are the same or unique to the individuals? And what were some of the skills developed that were common or in common with others? Well, I th it, well, let me let me answer that um, and just talk more broadly about um, the the kind of the concept of ambiguity and learning to to handle ambiguity. So. I, I think that people have a real range of responses and reactions and ways of coping with ambiguity, but we have seen some patterns in some of the research that we've done. So one of the tools, um, it's, it's actually on the D-School website um, that you might, you might try for yourself if you're interested, is um, a set of, uh, it's a metaphor-based activity where we ask people to talk about, you know, for me, ambiguity feels like blank. And you can see some really interesting patterns in how people respond to that. There are people who think about ambiguity as like, this is something I have to grit my teeth and endure and I want it to be over as soon as possible. There are people who see it as something that they want to selectively engage with. Like sometimes people are really comfortable with ambiguity in their personal lives, but not at work. And sometimes it's completely the opposite. And those folks kind of talk about metaphors that are like, well, you have to go through it and it's hard, but then you come out the other side and I'm always relieved when that's true. And then there's a kind of a third group that their metaphors are like, I love ambiguity. I want to embrace ambiguity. Ambiguity is like falling in love. Like it's the most meaningful experience. You never know what's going to happen to you. I mean, just like really effusively bonded to working in messy, complex, you know, challenges. So we, we have seen that range. Um, and I don't think that the goal is to like try to convert everybody to one particular version, but I have seen it be incredibly powerful for teams when you identify kind of how you relate to ambiguity and you bring that into your, to your, you know, conversation, your professional environment or your team environment, and just have some like honest discussion about it because it, it really, and it's really useful on a team to have a range of those perspectives. People who don't like a lot of opportunity or often, or ambiguity are, um, they are often the person who's like, Hey, we really do have to make this decision today. So let's like, stop, you know, coming up with new ideas and pick the one that we're going to act on. And folks who are sort of, you know, on the, on the, I love ambiguity spectrum are, you know, the ones who can like help bring like a totally different way of thinking about something to the table. So I, I really think it takes all different, all different attitudes. 
My my colleague Jill just sent me a direct message that I was I was still sharing my screen when I was holding up the book. So apologies. Oh. <laughs> that, part, that was hard for everybody to see, but it it really um the it was an incredible collaboration with our illustrator named Mike Hershen. So like for example, this is the more detailed version of the student story um, that I mentioned. There are a lot of graphical elements, and then each of the you know each of the assignments has some really some some visuals that I hope bring to life the um like the emotional experience of of leaning into that particular new skill or that approach um that was my that was my hope that we could capture some of that that feeling of trying something new and challenging yourself